Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the session on Build Your Brand. Um, Ranjani Mani uh, today has joined us, and uh, she's currently a, a global team lead of analytics managers, data scientists, and business analytics uh, in Atlassian. Uh, as part of her role, she engages with cross-functional problems uh, across product management, engineering, uh, technical, and executives to solve business problems across customer experience in Atlassian. She has more than 15 years of experience and she has graduated from top of the class in Bachelor of Engineering. And she's also a silver medalist uh, MBA from Ahmedabad. Ranjani is popular in LinkedIn. She has nearly like 25K followers in LinkedIn. And probably I'm one of them too. Uh, she does book reviews, shares anecdotes and her learnings, uh, fostering the culture of giving back to the community, right? She's passionate about tech, books, and being better. Uh, she is. She has never really uh, let her gender define what she should and shouldn't do. Uh, that is great about her. And her values are own what you do, people first, start with why, act, fail fast, and iterate, and also play fair, always. Awesome. And she is a brand in herself, and she's here to talk to us about building your brand. So over to you, Ranjani. Thank you, Deepti. Um, it's always great to hear from Women Who Code. Um, I've been a participant, so I'm really glad to uh, be here as a speaker today. Um, and it's also a favorite topic of mine, right? Branding. Um, so before we even delve into like the presentation, um, I want to keep this very interactive, right? Um, I do have slides, I can walk through them, but I also want to make sure that we address any questions you have on the topic. So feel free to add your questions to the chat and uh, Deepti probably you could help me with uh, uh, you know, picking them up. Um, and I'd love to make sure that this is a win-win conversation, right? And not just a monologue. Okay, so having said that, um, why am I so interested in branding, right? Uh, I have a degree in it, uh, BB. So um, I did my master's uh, majoring in branding, minoring in econometrics and analytics, right? So um, that partially explains my interest in brand building uh, in itself. And I remember the first time, um, first class, uh, when uh, we, we were in this huge uh, uh, seminar hall and this person walks in uh, the head of uh, the head of brand management and he uh, asks us about you know think about your favorite brands wh why do you think brands are different and things like that and I remember this anecdote he called out uh, after all of these years right like after a decade or so around how uh, I think it's probably L'Oreal um, that it doesn't sell a product but it sells dreams right and most luxury brands are that way. They don't sell products, but they sell dreams. And if you think deeply, right, um, you associate different adjectives to different brands. What you would associate L'Oreal with is very different from what would you would associate Starbucks with, right? So they serve a purpose in terms of defining what you want to be, what you want to be shown as, what you want to be known as, right? So therefore, I, I thought when we talk about branding, it's very relevant for us to figure out um, what we stand for as people, right? So this session, therefore, um, I have it more aligned to identifying what you can do to design your career, right? Because a brand in itself, that's not the end goal. The end goal is for us to leverage a brand to design the career we want to live, right? So that's what my session is going to be about. But as we do this, feel free to shoot your questions. So with that, uh, Safaya, could you please help uh, share the slides? Yeah, super. So let's talk about identifying what you as a brand stand for and how we can use that to define your career, right? And um, I have this subtext saying, taking active control in shaping your career. I feel like a lot of us um, tend to take tend to take a very backseat rule, right? Where we say, okay, let we follow the flow. We see how things happen. But um, one thing um, I've been very conscious about when I speak to uh, leaders is um, they are very intentional about it, right? They're very intentional in terms of what they are doing, what they want to do. And that requires us taking active control of it, right? So let's look at 
how we identify at the end of the session. Hopefully, you all can go back with some clarity on how you all can do this for your own careers. All right. So with that context, Sophia, do you mind going to the next slide, please? Yeah. Okay, so I've split this into like a five step process. Think of it as a guided path, right? So um, at the end of the session, go back home and probably if you were to drive through, take some time, write in your journal. And if you were to pinpoint like these five steps, probably at the end of this exercise, maybe it's going to take you 30 minutes, but at the end of this 30 minute exercise, hopefully you have better clarity in terms of who you are, what your values are, what you stand for, what you want to be doing, right? And that's the end goal for all of us, right? So um let's let's get started with this and maybe i can help you kick start and you can complete this process uh, later on right so uh do you want to go to the next slide so far super so there's this very favorite book of mine alice in wonderland i'm sure most of you folks might have read this in school right so uh i feel like this is one of those books Every time you read, you leave with something more. It's just so much of complexity to it. And there's this quote in the book, uh, which is a huge favorite, right? So um, Alice is um, at this fork in the road and she's kind of wondering, oh, which road do I take? So there's this cat, Cheshire cat sitting on the tree. And she uh, looks at the cat and she asks, you know what, um, where do I go, right? I don't know where to go. And uh, then the cat says, um, uh, okay, if I, I can direct you in terms of where to go, you know where you want to go. And she says, I don't know. So that, then uh, the cat says this really nice line, right? So if you don't know where you want to go, any road can take you there, right? It doesn't matter which road you take. And that's been so impactful. I think about it a lot because uh, if, if you're not really sure where that point B is, you're probably at A, if you're not sure to yourself where that point B is, then any road can take you there, right? You tend to go over the place because you don't really know which that path is. So that, that I feel is a good starting point for us to identify, right, where you want to go. So with that, um, if you could go to the next slide, uh, Safai. Yeah, so I want you folks to do this two minute exercise. Um, if you'll have a notepad in front of you, if you have a screen in front of you, um, I'm going to time this, give you folks a couple of minutes. So uh, take a minute to write down what you are interested in, right? Um, you, each of you are probably playing specific roles. So think about, do you want expanded responsibilities? What does that look like aligned to your strengths? Um, I'm, I'm going to use an example from analytics, right? So maybe you are doing reporting. You want to do more around analytics or you want to pivot to a new area altogether and do product management or you have a business problem which you think you want to solve for you're good at connecting the dots you're good at strategy whatever that is right so list down like five things you would want to do as part of your role right which you're not doing today or you are good at so 138 i'm gonna give you folks time until 140 to do this I love the comments which are coming in um, as you folks do this. Yeah, Akanksha, starting with why, I think is like the biggest thing of all, right? So great point there. All right, so um, this is probably not sufficient time uh, to do this. This definitely uh, took me like 15 minutes, just a free flow thought, right? About what I am, what I'm gonna do, things like that. But I would highly recommend uh, you'll continue with this exercise even after the session or tomorrow, do this, right? And figure out how this can help you. All right, so um, as you write down, one thing I did wanna highlight is this 
point around narrow framing. Okay, so there's this book called Decisive. I'm going to give you a lot of book options because I, I love reading books. So uh, this is one of my favorite books, right? So he talks about how when we are choosing things, we have a very narrow framing. Now, what does that mean, right? So we ask yes or no questions when we when we choose a question. So for example, should I eat at place A or should I eat at place B, right? Should I resign from my job or not? Should I move to this place or not? So these are typically um, yes or no questions. Instead, he says, ideally, what we should be doing is broadening it. So instead of saying, uh, should I resign from my job or not? We should probably take a step back and say, what is it that I seek from a career, right? How can I get there? Maybe there are certain things which you get from a career. Maybe there are certain things for you get from doing something else, right? So by expanding on that scope of what you want to do by asking the right question, you tend to get at the right answer. If you have your question narrow, then you tend to um, have answers which don't necessarily solve your problem, right? So I think that's, that's what I wanted to share in the slide, that whether or not decisions do not necessarily help us a long time, right? So as you put to you, together your points, also think about the right questions. Your question should be broader around, what do I seek from my life? life? What do I seek from a career? Right. Rather than saying, oh, should I get to the next position? Should I ask for a promotion or not? Don't tend to have yes or no questions. All right. OK, so with that, um, let's uh, the book's name is Decisive by Chip and Dan Heath. Highly, highly recommend that book. Yeah. All right. Can you go to the next slide? Um, yeah. So th this is uh, a summary of what I was just saying. Right. Widen your options. Um, anytime you think of yourself saying, oh, yes or no, step back and look at whether you can have better options, broader options than what you are doing, right? And uh, one thing I really want to call out here is the opportunity cost. We don't think a lot in terms of opportunity cost. So, for example, I was talking to this person who was moving jobs, right? And she was like, oh, you know what? I'm getting like a 15% raise, you know, and I've been in this role. I'm not really getting there. So maybe I should move, right? So that's what happens when you have an arrow frame. Should I move or not? Rather, if she were to step back and say, what is important for me? How does this career provide me that? Then maybe she'll reevaluate it differently, right? So, for example, one thing which is very important for her is flexibility. Um, and moving uh, to a new job would require, required her to travel, right? Which is like two hours back and forth, which is a huge opportunity cost. Maybe she's getting that 15% raise, but she's not thinking about it in terms of the cost, mental cost, time cost, money, which is going to add up with that additional two hours, right? So I think that's the point around thinking holistically around your options versus thinking, ah, should I do this or not, right? So that's that's the that's the point I wanted to communicate there. All right. Um, yeah, so most people kind of get stuck here, right? So, okay, all this makes sense. How do I get there? And I wish there was a silver bullet. There isn't. But uh, what I did want to... Um, share on this slide is what I've seen people do and seen people do well, right? Again, I'm, I, I believe I'm like a work in progress. Um, it's not like I figured it all, but I, I'm focused on figuring out what people who have successful do, right? And this is certain things which I believe they do really well. Now, each of these slides have a backup slide. So um, if you can have a look at the slide later, do go through the details. But what I did want to highlight here is um, a few things, right? One, um, let me start uh, left to right, right? Investing in yourself. I think this is a deal breaker. Now, um, if uh, a place I want to be in is Web3, if a place I want to be in is understand metaverse better, I think it's very critical for us to invest in ourselves, keeping that learning going. And again, when we say learning, we think of it in terms of learning from books, learning from a course. I think learning comes in multiple aspects, right? Learning comes from talking to people, talking to experts, understanding what that role means. So there was this person uh, I spoke to. She was the lead. I think she was uh, very keen on moving from services to a product company, right? Now, for her, learning doesn't necessarily mean just learning about the products. Yes, it helps for us to get certification. Learning for her also could mean that she identifies 10 people in her network who are working in her target product companies and talk to them to understand, okay, what do you do? What is it that makes you successful in the role? Uh, what is it then map it back to her to say, okay, they do ABC. 
I know A, how can I pick up B, C, D, right? So I think it's critical to think of learning again holistically, not necessarily in terms of, oh, I'm picking up a particular course. At the end of this course, some magically I'm going to get there, right? So that's one, investing yourself. B, putting yourself out there. And this, I think, is so aligned to the brand building, which we've been talking about, right? I think putting yourself out there is not about you know, talking about like showing yourself as what you're not that I think people tend to confuse that, right? It's not branding is not in terms of saying you're something which you're not, but rather having the courage to put yourself out there, even when you are scared about failure or being judged. There are so many times when I'm writing on LinkedIn or doing a podcast or doing anything at all, where I kind of wonder why will people listen to me? Like, why right i'm not an expert at this i probably know a bit but i'm not an expert why will people listen to me right so that tends to hold us back fear tends to hold us back but one thing i very strongly believe is uh, you know progress is at the edge of failure it's at the edge of your comfort zone right doing things what you're not qualified for is what puts you in the next level applying for jobs where you're probably 60 70 percent uh, suitable is putting yourself out there right Posting on things where you probably are not an expert, but you have a perspective which you've learned by reading things is putting yourself out there. So I think it's very critical to do this. And uh, it applies a lot when I'm hiring also, for example, versus a static CV. If I were to look at a person who has a portfolio of work, which he's done, projects which he, he or she has done, would I prefer B? Yes, absolutely. Right. Because I know there is tangible proof. So I think it's critical for us to do this also. Right. Or, um, you know, not hold ourselves back from doing this. Drive value and solve problems. Uh, I think this is universal. One of those universal truth. Um, irrespective of what role you play, whether you're a software engineer, analytics leader, you're doing sales, whatever you're doing, um, you become uh, go up the ladder, you perform well, if you can drive value. So I think that's, uh, again, it sounds very commonsensical, but I think many people don't consciously focus on things, right? Identify three things, which is your boss's concern. If I were to come and ask you, what are your top three pain points which your boss has, you should be able to identify and list that out. And if you can solve those things for your leaders, that puts you in a very valuable position, right? I think that's key identifying those and solving for them. Uh, reach out and network. Um, this, again, it's self-exploratory. Only thing I would add here is people tend to think of networking as something you do um, when you need something. You know, there are people who wouldn't have spoken like for 10 years and then they suddenly reach out because they want a job. I, again, I'm not quite judging that, but I think it's important for us to figure out that networking is relationship building and that takes time, right? So network when you don't have to first give and then take, right? That's very important. So build out those relationships over time. And I think then it's easier. So I, I have this, as they say, board of advisors, right? People I can reach out to at uh, any time, uh, leaders, because I've built that relationship over time. And I think that happens, um, it's a long game, right? And that's the next point I want to call out. It's a long game, play the long game. People tend to think, oh, what's in it for me, right? Like I can volunteer for this, but what's in it for me? I think people who win are those who play the long game, who do more of giving first before they take, right? Uh, that's, that's what I wanted to share when we say play the long game. And uh, finally, tell your story. Uh, one of my mentors told me this, right? Like if you were to, um, you know, meet your CEO somewhere, um, what would you talk to him or her about, right? If you meet a, uh, your leaders, say your skip level leader, what will you talk about? If you have five minutes, what is your story? How will you tell your story? Everyone should have that story at the back pocket, right? Uh, it shouldn't be something I stutter and figure out, okay, what, what, what do I talk? And everyone at any point in time, you should know, okay, this is what I stand for. These are my adjectives. This is, I would be, uh, if I were to describe myself, I'm a very passionate person. So you should have three adjectives by which you describe yourself. You should have a couple of lines about the kind of work you do, what you would love to do, right? So write down your story, right? And it, it doesn't have to be a big thing. It could be like five line no paragraph, but have that story ready because that is who you are. And having that clarity yourself is important before you share it with others, right? So that's like a summary of um, what I wanted to share here. Uh, again, it's not exhaustive, but hopefully it gives you a starting point uh, to 
go to your next step, right? And build your brand. With that, um, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. So this, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, slides. Um, and again, I'm going to give you another book recommendation. Um, Lynchpin, um, I think it's by Seth Gordon, if I'm not mistaken. So Lynchpin is another favorite book of mine. And uh, a huge uh, narrative, the entire narrative is around this point, right? Are you really dispensable, indispensable? Now, um, that, he says, depends on whether you're an artist or a painter. Now, what, what do you mean by artist or a painter, right? So he talks about this um, village, I think it's called Dafun, uh, somewhere in China, probably, right? And he says that village, it's very famous for uh, creating paintings. So a um, lot of people, so a lot of people in that village create all of these paintings, which you're seeing in the picture, right? And they sell it for probably $10, $20 online. So uh, Seth talks about how he owns one of these paintings, which he bought for like $25. Um, and then he asks this question, um, do I know who painted it? No. Do I care? No, because that was a painter, not necessarily an artist, right? So that is what differentiates you from probably someone else. So when you're building a brand, uh, figure out how do you become an artist? Now, how do you become an artist? That, that's the next question, right? I think uh, the way he explains it is, we earlier, maybe a century ago, we were in this era where we had we had this mechanical processes like a supply mm -hmm. chain, right? You do A, then you do B, then you do C. You tend to be dispensable in such situations. Like say you are a person who moves one load from A to B. Can someone else do it? Yeah. Can someone else do it cheaper, faster, better? Yeah, absolutely, right? So that is someone who could be dispensable. But in the knowledge economy, which is where we are, it's... Um, Usually the, the way it works is no one really can tell you do A, B, and C, and D, right? Because it's, we work in ambiguous em environments. We work on complex problems. So the ones who usually are indispensable and valuable are the ones who can figure out how to get from A to B to C to D without being told, right? So if you are the person who can identify problems to be solved, if you are the person who can bring it all together, then you become indispensable. So he talks about how like if I were to give an example, if all you can do is to code in Python, then yeah, someone else can probably do it, right? But if you can code well in Python, if you can also understand like the business context uh, and translate it into a technical problem and do the storytelling, that combination of skills probably makes you unique, right? Now, my point is not that you should do, you know, you should become an expert at all. No, right? But think of it in terms of skill stacking. Everyone has a unique set of skills, right? So how do you bring them together to make yourself unique? That probably is what makes you an artist and not a painter. And therefore, uh, you know, makes you indispensable. Author name of Lynchpin is Seth Gordon, S-E-T-H Gordon, G-O-D-I-N. Yeah. So highly, highly recommend the book as well. And uh, yeah, with that, maybe the last thing I wanted to share, if you could go to the next slide, uh, yeah, so this is a quote from the same thing. Um, uh, I'll probably read out the first line, right? The job is what you do when you're told what to do, right? A job is showing up at a factory, following instructions, managing spec, and, you know, being managed. Um, and that's what he says, right? Someone else can always do the job a little bit better, faster, cheaper, right? But uh, art is what you do when no one can tell you exactly how to do it. Then you become difficult to replace, right? No one else can replace you that way. Yeah, and that comes with taking personal responsibility, ownership, and challenging the status quo and making it better. Yeah, so um, be an artist, not a painter. Yeah, all right. So um, if you could go to the next slide, Sapayo. Yeah, so this, um, this I feel very strongly about as well. I've been this very driven person, type A personality, wanting to do it all, right? And um, I think at some point in time, I realized that I was getting burnt out. I was prioritizing my family at the bottom of the list. And while it's very important to build your brand, identify what you want to do, design your career, do all of these things as women, as mothers, it is difficult to do. It is always, and again, it is difficult for everyone, right? It's also difficult, uh, particularly difficult for us in terms of managing all of these priorities. And the process, I think the key is not to miss out on living a life, right? So I think that's why I call it the art of creating a life while making a living, right? So the most dangerous risk of it all is uh, spending your life doing what 
um, you want um, to buy the freedom to do it later, while that later may not necessarily uh, come soon, right? So I think, again, the last book recommendation I'm going to leave you with is this. It's called um, The Art of Creating a Life While Making a Living. Uh, it, it is from this book called The Monk and the Riddle. Um, uh, the Monk and uh, the, I think it's called The Riddle, right? Yeah. So this is written, interestingly, by a, a startup venture capitalist, right? But I love the book. Um, I think the narrative is exactly what I just told you, right? That uh, while we all rush and uh, focus on doing things, let's also uh, think about, you know, having a life through it all. Uh, while you focus on the urgent things, also make time for the important things, right? Having that differentiation between urgent and important is also super relevant for us. Yeah, so I think that's all I had, Sophia, if I remember right. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so that, that's all I had. Um, uh, I, I wanted to make sure that this gives you like a guided path to identifying what you are, what you stand for, what you want to be. And that is super essential for us to build a brand, right? Um, so yeah, connect with me in LinkedIn. I'm very happy um, to talk to folks who are passionate about women in tech and uh, hopefully this, or books, right? So hopefully this has been helpful to you folks. And um, Deepthi, I know we have only a few minutes, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, folks. Hey, Ranjani, that was amazing. Uh, I could connect with you from the time you started telling L'Oreal how it, it's, it's a brand which sells dreams and not just a, a brand that sells products. So you associate so much feelings with the brand and being a brand ourselves, I think it's, 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 it requires a lot of effort. And thanks for taking us through that. Uh, how do we first defining where we want to go and how do we go about it? That was awesome. I liked all those anecdotes you talked about, about Alice in Wonderland, how do you become a linchpin, about the story you shared about the painters in, in, a, in a village. So awesome, Ranjani, we loved it. Uh, we'll wait for some questions. Uh, people, if you have questions, please drop it in the chat. I'll take them. Many of them were interested in the books you shared. That was awesome. Yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah I, I, uh, I do. Uh, I think if I were not uh, working, I would probably be like a librarian. So I do a lot. I'm always looking out for book recommendations. I also post about book reviews on my website. So I'm going to share both my LinkedIn and my website. So feel free to have a look. Uh, it has a lot of book recommendations there. Yeah. So one question from Srishti is, uh, you said play the long game, but mm -hmm. until when? Like yeah. today's world and job market is highly opportunistic. So until when do you play the game? Yeah. So uh, again, a mentor once told me this. I, I love talking to people. I have coffee chats with people. So I have like a lot of mentors. Deeply. So one person particularly mentioned this, right? He mentioned that it's kind of like a circle, our entire careers, um, we tend to think that we are going very fast when we skip like four roles in the first five years, we tend to think, Oh, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm catching up. Right. So yeah, it does. Um, but I think in the long term, what he did mention is we all catch up. Right. And now when I say catch up, it doesn't mean that, Oh, we all catch up and everyone becomes a senior director as we at the same point. No, not necessarily, not in terms of titles, not in terms of salary, but we catch up in different ways. Right. So like, for example, um, after a point in time, you may realize that, um, okay, I don't enjoy this career somehow, right? Maybe I want to do something else. You get there. You, all of us catch up in terms of the satisfaction around what we want from our careers, right? So I think what he, the point he was conveying is, it, while it is easy to kind of switch jobs, make sure that you're clear. And again, I, I don't want to prescribe saying you should do it or you shouldn't do it. It is different. People are different. They come from um, different places. So it is very easy a very personal decision to take. But my only take I would say is be very clear about why you're doing what you're doing, right? If you're moving it, it for like a salary hike of X percentage, 10 percentage or 15 percent, if you're moving it for one alone, think about whether 
you know, how it is impacting your other variables also, right? So I would say be very clear about the decision yourself. Don't do it just because someone else is doing it. I know many people say, oh, I want to be a data scientist because everyone else is doing it, right? But maybe you don't enjoy it. So be clear about the reasons why you want to do it. Um, while it's very easy to, you know, do things, but uh, be true to yourself, right? And again, there's no right or wrong answer. I've moved like four different roles in my first uh, six, seven years. And then I stayed with the same company for the next eight years. So I think it's very different about why you do things the way you do. But yeah, be clear about that. Yeah. I go, I go. Define your own path and make sure you're happy in that path. That's yeah. what defines it. It's not the duration you are in the game, but how well you pay the, play the game. Correct. Yep, yep. So this other question, uh, people ask for experience when you uh, when you switch your career. So how can you have an experience before you choose a new career? So uh, yeah, yeah, it's a honest question. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's, uh, it's true, right? I think uh, the way I interpret it is two things, right? One, as a newbie, when you're starting off, uh, expecting people to have experience in things even before you start off, I think it's very unfair, right? Um, does it happen? Yeah, to an extent it does, but um, it is unf is it unfair? It is unfair, yes, right? But I also believe that there are probably opportunities, rarely so, but we still have opportunities for newbies to kind of get into the roles, right? So uh, it kind of, I I'm thankful that there are at least some of them who don't, you know, who don't do it the same way that others do. So yeah, um, that's for newbies. But in general, I think that when you're switching careers, the way I see it is, um, there are few who think you need to start from scratch. So for example, I think I was speaking to someone who comes from a very software engineering background. She's done project management and then she wanted to switch it to data sciences. Now, um, there could be certain organizations who want to take her at an entry level position, right? But I think, again, it's very unfair to her uh, because um, there are a lot of transferable skills, right? Um, it's the prerogative of the organization to look at those transferable skills. It's a prerogative of the individual to also showcase that and build on it and uh, say that, you know what, I'm doing ABC, which I think can add, help me here, right? And then additionally, I've also done this. So I think it's the prerogative of the individual also to position himself or herself in the right place so that they can leverage upon this, right? So I, I would say it, the onus falls on both of them. So yeah, um, while I know it is difficult, but see if you can position yourself accordingly and also find the roles which would probably be suitable for you right so that's that's what i would say Rajshri. yeah but great question yeah ranjani uh thank you i think yeah. we are uh, half an eye into it thanks for your time and it was wonderful listening to you live i've seen a lot of your videos on linkedin but it was awesome to hear you live and thanks thank for you. taking time on thank you dp thank you everyone great being here yeah take care folks have a great weekend